Greetings from LA, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journeys, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2024. And here we have a title uh, using the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray format. And this is a Criterion release designated by Criterion at spy number 1208. And uh, this is a film which is described as being from the year 1939. And the name of the filmmaker is Raoul Walsh. And the name of the work is The Roaring Twenties. This is the film, the, the supremely entertaining film. Uh, what a great film to have in the Criterion Collection. This film, which is described as being from the year 1939, and it is uh, the story, the screenplay is uh, by Jerry Walden, Richard McCauley, and Robert Rosen, based upon the story by Mark Hellinger, and of course it's directed by Raoul Walsh, and it has a, a classic golden, golden cast, uh, included in which are James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart, uh, and also Priscilla Lane and uh, Gladys George and Jeffrey Lynn and uh, Frank McHugh and others. Wow, what a stellar, stellar cast. Uh, Humphrey Bogart uh, and the one and only James Cagney as uh, Eddie Bartlett in this film about uh, romance and the American dream and gangsters and prohibition and the rise and fall of uh, our main characters and the sweep of history from World War I into, and the title says it all, this film, The Roaring Twenties. And my goodness, my goodness, again, The Roaring Twenties is in the Criterion Collection, courtesy of this great, great release, uh, 4K UHD, uh, and the Blu-ray combo uh, two-disc set, which is, or two-disc release, which is what I have here in front of me, and that uh, this is purported to be based on new 4K digital restoration, and so we'll talk about the, uh, maybe I'll share a little bit about my my reaction, my subjective view on uh, my how I feel about how this looks and sounds, uh, courtesy of this new release. But my goodness, yes, this Raoul Walsh vehicle, uh, a great combination from uh, uh, these uh, legends of Hollywood, uh, Humphrey Bogart, and of course the one and only James Cagney in one of the great James Cagney performances. It's so nuanced, so uh, so effervescent, and so lively, filled with life, and it captures the great sense of highs and lows. The ups and downs, the triumphs and disappointments, and everything in between uh, that is part of the story of, the, of this, uh, this character, this gangster, uh, our hero or anti-hero, uh, the Eddie character uh, in the context of this film, the sweep of this film, uh, The Roaring Twenties. So uh, The Roaring Twenties, uh, a very, another classic Warner Brothers gangster film. Uh, and I think it, it's gotten a lot of attention over the years, and I think this release uh, is echoing uh, past non-criterion releases that we've seen of this film. I mean, I have a D an earlier DVD of this, uh, but it's nice to see uh, this package uh, presented by Criterion using uh, what looks and sounds to be a really lovely uh, presentation of this. The Roaring Twenties. Um, if we were to try, my dear friends, to speak about the plot or story structure, of this film, The Roaring Twenties, I think we would focus in on sort of the sweep of history and uh, the flow of the character relationships and developments. Uh, we meet uh, our core set of characters, essentially three, our triumvirate, our trio. Uh, and this is the uh, character, this is Lloyd and George and Eddie. And these are the characters portrayed by Jeffrey Lynn and Humphrey Bogart and James Cagney, respectively. And we meet them as soldiers. Uh, in World War I. So they are under a tremendous sense of uh, life and death stakes pressure. Uh, but there is a camaraderie uh, type of uh, a brotherhood sense of camaraderie that develops between and among uh, these characters. And we understand, therefore, that their lives will therefore be forever intertwined, for better or for worse. Uh, and we see from the outset that they have uh, uh, seemed to have forged a kind of friendship 
or loyalty-based friendship. And that loyalty-based friendship will perhaps uh, uh, maybe coincide with each other as they proceed outside of or beyond uh, the end of the contours of, uh, of the First World War and into uh, uh, the American lifestyle of the 1920s. Uh, and what that brings with it in terms of uh, livelihood or economic downturn on the one hand or limited, uh, limited uh, means on the one hand, but that also brings about it with a sense of opportunity. And uh, the centerpiece of this uh, for these characters, uh, and specifically for uh, characters like Eddie and George, the James Cagney character and the Humphrey Bogart character, we know will be in the world of crime and gangsters, and yes, prohibition. And so this will form the sweep and almost the, the hypnotic uh, type of uh, allure of uh, all their dreams and ambitions and the, the high stakes and the high rolling and the uh, and the sort of the the, uh, the 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 verve and the panache and everything that is involved with this uh, luxurious lifestyle but also very dangerous lifestyle uh, because we also understand that with these stakes uh, come they come across or uh, maybe the Eddie character comes across uh, certain aspects of of uh, 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 maybe gangland warfare or uh, territory uh, territorial disputes involving uh, uh, maybe alcohol routes and supply chain and uh, dealing with the authorities and we also come to realize that maybe uh, they might uh, the three of them that we meet in the war early on in the film they might get separated but they also might be finding themselves at different points of a type of moral spectrum or immoral spectrum as a case may be and so at some point maybe they separate but then uh, through a certain set of circumstances Eddie and George for example the James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart character do collide and perhaps that leads to an easy or maybe uneasy alliance uh, between these two uh, titans of the gangster world that's presented here in the Roaring Twenties on the one hand as well as uh, the rise of uh, say the uh, quote unquote uh, the legal side of things uh, with respect to uh, where Lloyd, the third character in this triumvirate, arises. But as we know, or as uh, as might be uh, come to be expected with a wonderful film like this, that's not the end of the tale because we also have uh, embedded into this story. It's also introduced early on a type of love story or various strands of of love stories that are intertwined here, involving uh, James Cagney and Priscilla Lane character, how they are introduced to each other early on, uh, and that circumstances maybe separate them, but they come together again, again, when we get into uh, the Roaring Twenties proper in the film Progression. Uh, but we also see, too, this wonderful setup of a type of romance or love triangle. Um, uh, one person loves the other, but uh, it's not reciprocated because that person loves someone else. That kind of dramatic tension, which is set up so superbly and so wonderfully and, and filled with a lot of, I think, suspense and as well as a lot of dramatic tug. And I think at the heart of that, uh, we have uh, the performances here, uh, Jeffrey Lynn and Priscilla Lane and James Cagney. Uh, and so we have this type of... Uh, of uh, uh, James Cagney, uh, the Eddie Bartlett character, pursuing uh, desperately and perhaps hopelessly uh, trying to pursue uh, the uh, Priscilla Lane character and, and seeing her characters rise in terms of of the world of dance and performance and how that also interacts with uh, this uh, culture of the Roaring Twenties and the speakeasy and prohibition and also how that brings uh, to the fore the nightclub scene and uh, also not just the potential relationship between James Cagney's character and Priscilla Lane's character but also the relationship uh, between uh, Eddie, James Cagney's character and uh, Panama. Uh, this is the great performance by Gladys George uh, which also brings with it not just the Sense of a type of, of maybe uh, a kind of a, a, a groundedness uh, that uh, the Panama character provides in this uh, very maybe world weary, world wise kind of uh, snippets of wisdom that may or may not be breaking through uh, into the sort of the romantic cloud of a vision that is the Eddie Bartlett's sort of worldview perspective, perhaps affected by or maybe even clouded or, or obscured by uh, his obsession with uh, uh, the Jean character, Priscilla Lane character. And so how that 
coincides with yet a furtherance of the uh, the strengthening or tension of one of the core relationships of the triumvirate that we met uh, that we mentioned earlier. That being the relationship between uh, James uh, Cagney's character and um, the Lloyd character, the Jeffrey Lynn character, because uh, that also forms part of this love triangle that is emerging. But that's not all, because as I mentioned, we also have other great titans of uh, this golden age of Hollywood uh, gangster cinema, Warner Brothers gangster cinema. Uh, and uh, those being uh, here the performances, the George character and Eddie character, so Humphrey Bogart and and uh, James Cagney. And we know that they might seem to be friends, they might seem to be allies, but there is a type of uneasiness at play here. And we can feel it in the air because of the, the, the bubbly, almost um, uh, a, just the bubbly chaos uh, that we see uh, burst forth on the screen when we see these two uh, interact with each other, either when they're separate or, or together. You know that there's a type of volatility uh, that is undeniable. And that volatility means, uh, and that we can intuit as viewers, that they might, in fact, be on a collision course. Because George and Eddie, one of the things that is driving this is there is a, a type of, of a friendship, but there's also a rivalry. And that rivalry has the uh, potential of totally destroying uh, everything that has uh, that Eddie and company has seen built up over the years. But not just that, but how circumstances change. Because with the start of Prohibition also comes the sweep and flow and also the end of Prohibition. And so we have how uh, people are reacting uh, to not just the end of Prohibition, but also uh, the events uh, that lead to the end of the 20s. Uh, the great uh, sort of a financial crisis that ends this decade and how that affects both positively and negatively uh, our main characters that we remember meeting for the first time again uh, in the uh, in the uh, context of uh, fighting together uh, in solidarity uh, to a certain degree uh, in the Great War, uh, but now uh, in various points uh, towards the end of uh, the so-called Roaring Twenties, this decade, we might see them at uh, potentially quite opposite ends of the spectrum. And if that's the case, then uh, what does that bode for our heroes or anti-heroes and uh, everything that uh, we have seen lead up to this? What does that mean in terms of a final collision course uh, that is taking place between and among uh, these three uh, core friends uh, that we met at the start of the film? And it forms this wonderful backbone of, uh, of uh, attention and sweep in history that is also at its core a a, uh, just a, a, a giddy, delightful uh, 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 mix, a volatile mix of uh, uh, gangster violence and mayhem, uh, this type of betrayal and friendship and loyalty, uh, friends who have been loyal. There might be uh, sudden bursts of uh, violence that might totally uh, remove them from the picture. Uh, there is a tragedy and there's also uh, hope and love and romance and whether that becomes fulfilled or not. And that is embodied by so many things here uh, in terms of uh, the way that the speakeasy, uh, a, a violent tradition is, is uh, uh, represented here in this wonderful Hollywood golden age type of flow. And of course, at the heart and center could be said to be the brilliance of the performances. And I speak, of course, of everyone across the board Gladys George, for instance, uh, Priscilla Lane, for instance, uh, and then also undeniably uh, this volatile uh, combination of uh, the great Humphrey Bogart, who is so so sinister. There's something at the very just at the very beginning, uh, something that is just bubbling uh, to the surface that is revealing a type of almost. Um, uh, vile, uh, villainous, reptilian quality uh, that has the potential, perhaps maybe possibly, of striking at any moment in sort of bursts of chaos. Uh, but this is also maybe uh, forged in a sense of friendship or loyalty with the other great character of this uh, work, that is the Eddie character who's portrayed by the one, the only great James Cagney. What a performance, one of the great James Cagney performances. I mean, it's spoken, I think, with great with a great deal of skill and dexterity in some of the supplements that are included here in a way that's much better than I'm able to articulate. Uh, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this is a James Cagney performance that is so uh, multi-layered 
it's multi-textual in that he is not a, I mean, he, he is seen to be vulnerable. He is seen to be uh, at a loss sometimes. He's seen to be confused. He has seen his character, although arguably he is the, uh, the front and center, uh, the star of the film. There might be times where his character is con seen to be confronting situations that are beyond his control, that are beyond his comprehension, uh, such that he is caught uh, with the short end of the stick uh, sometimes, or oftentimes as the case may be. And that is not always a most flattering position to be in, but uh, James Cagney, and the way he his character articulates that uh, sense of, say, uh, betrayal or uh, 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 be uh, bewilderment or befuddlement and that sort of thing, uh, that he captures it so well. There's a sort of human essence that is at the heart of every James Cagney performance. And this and his Eddie is definitely one of them where he takes it and he takes it on the chin. He takes those losses and and he works with it and he he deals with it and uh, he he struggles with it and there are some moments where he is uh, maybe the struggle uh, gets the better of him and he's still overcome with a sense of shyness and bitterness uh, but he's trying to express it in a way that uh, isn't uh, uh, isn't meant to show in sort of bursts of violence uh, but rather it's meant to show kind of inward hurt and an inward uh, maybe uh, damage that may or mo may not be uh, irreparable and we see how that kind of uh, inward, almost psychological uh, uh, landscape that he is portraying, the Eddie character is portraying, how that comes to a head when we get to the final act of the film and how he acts in response to all these events that have changed as the history and backdrop has changed uh, through and, and up to the end of the, the so-called 1920s or the Roaring Twenties. So he articulates and also uh, um, he is embodying so many, I think, different variables uh, in the Eddie character that makes him both heroic and also anti-heroic. It makes him both a hero and a villain. And it makes him, I think, very vulnerable and very uh, strong and steadfast. And I love those uh, I love those uh, various uh, uh, contradictions within the character. It makes him even more human, more accessible in a, in a certain way of, uh, of, uh, of speaking. And so I think that's all to do with how um, I mean, it's all to do with how this character is situated, how it's developed in the context of this Raoul Walsh-directed film. It's a brilliant film, and it also has to do with the greatness of the James Cagney performance. It is truly one of the greats. Uh, and uh, there's a sense of menace and a sense of, of, a, of a, a sort of slyness and also a ruthlessness, but also there's a tenderness and there is a sense of warmth and there is a sense of that, that, that type of, of loyalty that's almost uh, charming in its naivete at many points. And I think James Cagney captures that so perfectly. It's one of my favorite James Cagney performances. I'm so glad uh, to be able to uh, be able to say I can revisit this uh, performance in this wonderful, uh, one of the classic gangster films uh, from this era, and indeed perhaps arguably from any era. Uh, and it's, uh, it has, I think, a really interesting uh, a positioning within the context of the gangster era, uh, the gangster films from this era, and which is spoken a little about, and a little bit more about, or a lot more about, I should say, with a great degree of skill in the commentary track, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and, su and uh, some of the other supplements as well, which is what we'll talk about later. There's a really great uh, sense of mix and styles, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful blend of uh, menace and violence and uh, that type of suspense and thrill as a thriller, but there's all, there are also these wonderful ways that music is used, uh, song and dance numbers, uh, Priscilla Lane's character's performances being one great example, and the feel that rush, that sense of uh, movement and energy. Uh, through the way that the, the times are being presented here, as well as showcasing this wonderful uh, interplay of friendship, loyalty, and betrayal. I mean, this is the stuff of great drama uh, and the stuff of great Hollywood entertainment, I would say, and uh, this is one great example of that. So uh, this is, I think, overall a wonderful package. It's a great film uh, to be able to uh, enjoy this, uh, get a sense of the taste of the, uh, the 1930s uh, Hollywood gangster film uh, with uh, some of the greats. Uh, great legends of, uh, of Hollywood and indeed of uh, this sort of film. I mean, it's one of the great films uh, with one of the great casts of all time uh, with Humphrey Bogart and James Cagney, uh, two powerhouses uh, here on a potential collision course uh, in this film, which is The Roaring Twenties.
The Criterion Collection has released this film, The Roaring Twenties, uh, courtesy of this wonderful release earlier this year, 2024. What I have in front of me here is the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray release, so it has two discs, one being the 4K UHD disc and the other being the Blu-ray disc, and so you can find the film uh, to be playable on either option on either disc. Um, there's also a commentary track uh, that you can also have as an option for either disc that you have in. Uh, but when we come to the supplement, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, you're going to have to put in the Blu-ray disc because the supplements will be found uh, only on the Blu-ray disc but on the 4K disc. But that's something that we have seen as a kind of customary approach that Criterion seems to be making in terms of their uh, combo releases. Supplements tend to be found on the Blu-ray disc. So this is no exception to that. But uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful release. And one of the reasons why I think it's very wonderful is because of how this film looks and sounds. Uh, this is reported to be based on a new 4K digital restoration with uncompressed monaural soundtrack and I've taken the liberty of removing uh, the uh, insert or leaflet here and the uh, it says it's a fold out and it says among its pages it says for instance about the master and I quote the Roaring Twenties is presented in its original aspect ratio of 1.37 to 1. This new digital master was created from the 35mm nitrate original camera negative in addition to a safety fine grain for some sections with both elements scanned and restored in 4K resolution. The original monaural soundtrack was remastered from the 35mm composite fine grain by the Criterion Collection. The feature is presented in Dolby Vision HDR high dynamic range on the 4K Ultra HD disc and high definition SDR standard dynamic range on the Blu-ray. So uh, that's what I have in the player. Oh, and by the way, I have the, the it's a wonderful Blu-ray menu um, or 4K menu as well, uh, but I've just got it uh, blocked off uh, for a little bit. And the reason why is uh, just, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful illustration. I really enjoy it, but it is of a key scene. Uh, that happens, uh, uh, which could be described as a kind of spoiler, I'm not sure, but just to be on the safe side, you know, for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this film, uh, I've put it, um, I've just blocked it off uh, and just blocked off the, the screen. I hope you can forgive me. I hope you can understand, but it's a wonderful illustration and it's very much in keeping with uh, the cover art design that, that we have here, but I'll speak a little bit about the cover art design uh, sometime later in this video discussion, but it's great, by the way. It's absolutely great, but um, so I guess just one other point, maybe um, you might want to just uh, try to play the, if you're going to watch the film for the first time, it's a wonderful art, uh, don't get me wrong, but maybe just to be on the safe side, if you want to preserve all the surprise, uh, just maybe try to avert your eyes and just play the film immediately upon putting the disc in. So try not to look at the, 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 the image on the on the uh, on the menu there, but uh, in any event, uh, it's I think a uh, uh, it's a wonderful film. I, I can't uh, I wish I could watch again for the first time because it, it, there's so much thrill uh, involved in the film uh, in terms of watching it for the first time. But and anyway, just keep that in mind. It's uh, just uh, if you are uh, truly interested in trying to preserve some of the surprise, uh, maybe just uh, try to avert your eyes uh, and then just press play and go right into the film proper. But uh, uh, but after you've done that, you can enjoy the wonderful artwork that is to uh, greet you when you see the uh, the Blu-ray or the 4K menu, uh, courtesy of the Criterion Collection. But uh, so just uh, with that point. Point being said, let me now point to the uh, the uh, the presentation. So I met, read the notes about the master. Now I have, I admit, I have very limited ex experience and exposure to this film in terms of I've never seen this in the movie theater. I've I've, uh, I've seen it uh, on home uh, video presentations. Uh, recent a non Criterion DVD is what I have of this film, The Roaring Twenties, and so uh, so it's always looked, I think, very very good uh, in those, uh, for instance, the earlier older DVD that I have. But it looks absolutely sparkling. This looks absolutely sparkling. It's like it's like a, a glass of champagne in the Roaring Twenties. You know what I mean? It, it's that type of bubbly, uh, vivaciousness. It, it feels so uh, crisp. It feels very. Um, it feels very. Uh, it, it 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 feels uh, like free of blemishes on the one hand, but still very much keeping uh, a type of fidelity with the film grain uh, that's in keeping with the films from the 1930s. It really has that wonderful look, and, and I. Love how it doesn't feel overly digital, digitally saturized, or anything of the sort. It feels 
uh, touched up just right. Uh, and so it, it looks absolutely splendid and it sounds uh, like a, it's just a wonderful experience overall. And so uh, I've enjoyed my experiences watching this on earlier non-criterion DVDs. But for me, this is the way to go. And I saw it on the 4K disc and I saw it on the Blu-ray disc and I saw it on the 4K disc again and I saw it on the Blu-ray disc again. Uh, so uh, I enjoyed it every single time and I just marveled at it. Uh, and it, it, it just, it felt so, uh, the contrasts were crisp and clean and it, uh, it, and when it entered into these uh, mo mo uh, motions and movements, it was uh, really wonderfully well rendered and just, uh, an overall pleasant experience. I'm, I think this looks uh, astounding. Uh, and again, uh, given my limited exposure and knowledge about this film, uh, with that, uh, still being said, or th with that in mind, I still find this Criterion release to be, for me, absolutely top-notch in terms of the look and sound. So I'm very, very happy, uh, with how this is, uh, appearing for purposes of this Criterion release. And so that's not all, because now let's move on to, uh, some of the other supplements and some of the other goodies. Uh, that we can also find uh, when we uh, watch this film courtesy of the Criterion Collection. So once again, as we've pointed out, there's the 4K disc and then there's the Blu-ray disc. I happen to have the 4K disc in the machine right now. And uh, with uh, either option, you can watch the film on the Blu-ray or on the 4K disc or or and or you can also watch the film with the option of having the audio commentary track on so that's for either uh, disc choice so uh, for purposes of the, here I have uh, the 4k disc on this uh, on the machine and when I press the commentary option it is saying the following this commentary track recording and recorded in 2005 features film historian Lincoln Hurst to listen to the commentary while viewing the movie, press the audio key on your remote at any time. So it's wonderful to have this commentary track made available uh, as well for purposes of this newer Criterion release. It is a wonderful commentary track. Uh, Lincoln Hurst commentary track is filled to the brim with so much uh, great information. I think, uh, uh, for instance, you know, I mentioned, or it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I think, uh, very uh, much one of the famous points of this uh, being a, in a type of legacy of uh, gangster films uh, from uh, Hollywood during this period of Warner Brothers, but there's an interesting contrast that can be said to be made between, say, this film, uh, Roaring Twenties, especially where it sits in the late 1930s, and um, with respect to maybe other earlier films, uh, gangster films like Little Caesar or The Public Enemy, etc. And so we have uh, what could be said to be a type of repositioning, uh, uh, maybe based upon a kind of uh, a moral cinema code uh, and the type of uh, content that seems to be emerging. Uh, and that also might have something to do with how James Cagney's character, his Eddie character in this film, uh, could be said to be comparing and contrasting with, say, other characters in his career, both prior to this and also post this. And uh, there, there might also seem to be maybe uh, one kind of point of maybe a contemporary criticism, I think that's been pointed out. Uh, uh, in the discussion, either in the commentary track or in the uh, in one of the other supplements, which we'll talk about, is uh, perhaps looking at the the James Cagney character as as being a quote unquote softer uh, gangster than he might have appeared, say, in earlier tougher, rougher, uh, more vicious uh, characterizations in other films, uh, starring him of a similar uh, story vein. Uh, but there is an interesting positioning of this film and how maybe there were certain maybe recommendations or expectations of a type of uh, 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 maybe morality in cinema, for lack of a better phrase. And so you know, we have there for this interesting uh, way in which this film seems to be trying to create, as I was mentioning before, the sense of the hero anti-hero, and that might be forging uh, a great uh, uh, mission into uh, uh, portraying the Eddie character in this way that uh, can be said to be ultimately quite valiant and quite uh, heroic indeed, especially when standing in stark contrast with the viciousness that is the George character, the Humphrey Bogart character. And this is another line I think is uh, delineated so well in the commentary track, uh, some background into the, the, the career, the trajectories of Humphrey Bogart and James Cagney and their collaborations, and also what will happen post the Roaring Twenties to James Cagney, also Humphrey Bogart. And also to, I, I should mention um, how this film, uh, seems to be positioning uh, itself uh, in the context of gangster films, both uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the violent and uh, uh, dramatic gangster films, but also you know, the type of uh, comedy uh, parody films as well. 
Uh, and so there's an interesting uh, contextual history that uh, Lingenhurst is presenting here in the commentary track, as well as other interesting stylistic choices that are made. There's some really interesting camera techniques as well uh, that are had. Also, the musical choices, uh, too, are very much uh, reflecting this idea of the jazz age and, and popularizing a number of standards, uh, not just uh, to uh, reflect the context of the story being had, but also in the context of uh, 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 the, the movie-making positioning of Rao Walsh and company uh, when making this film in the late 1930s. And also some interesting details, again, uh, uh, in terms of Priscilla Lane and also um, uh, Gladys George and also uh, Jeffrey Lynn and Frank McHugh and others and their working relationships in this type of film and also uh, relationships and approaches vis-a-vis uh, -vis the style of Raoul Walsh and also a little bit of background about Raoul Walsh, the great, great contribution here. Uh, so overall, this is, I think, a wonderful, uh, absolutely uh, top-notch commentary track. I'm so glad that uh, Criterion was able to uh, have this over for purposes of this recent release. So this is the commentary track uh, described as being from 2005 from Lincoln Hearst. Okay, so now I have the Blu-ray in, in the machine, and the same thing as before, um, the menu or the, the image that's used on the menu, it's a brilliant image, it's a wonderful illustration, uh, but just to be on the safe side, again, for the per, uh, benefit of those who have not yet seen this great, great film, The Roaring Twenties, I've just blocked it off uh, using uh, this superimposition for the purposes of this video. I hope you can forgive me. Um, I hope it's not too offending to the eye, but I just wanted to be absolutely sure. Uh, it's it's if you, It's possible to Try to uh, watch the film first and then uh, jump to this Blu-ray menu. It might be difficult, but uh, tr try your best. But I think it's really, really worth it because... Um, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a wonderful illustration uh, to greet you when you look at the Blu-ray menu. But in any event, I have the Blu-ray here because, uh, as we've discussed before, we have two discs for this release, the 4K UHD disc and now the Blu-ray disc. And so on either disc, you can watch the film. And on either disc, you can watch the film with the audio commentary track on. But the difference is, is that the 4K disc does not have supplements, whereas the Blu-ray disc does. And so now let us move to a discussion of the supplements. And so when I press the supplements button, we find three supplements. Uh, the first is Gary Giddens, and it's described as such. In, this, uh, in the following interview produced by the Criterion Collection in 2023, Film critic Gary Giddens discusses the performances in the Roaring Twenties and its place within the gangster genre. So this is a discussion with uh, the expert Gary Giddens, uh, approximately 22 minutes. This is really, really fantastic. And it's called The Underworld Moves On. Um, and it's focusing on the legacy of this film, uh, how this film was made in 1939, a type of gangster film, but also a film uh, that's setting forth the psycholo psychology of the characters, uh, in particular, uh, bringing to the fore these really uh, dynamic titans, uh, Humphrey Bogart's George and uh, James Cagney's Eddie, and also uh, Priscilla Lane and Jeffrey Lynn, etc., and also Gladys George, uh, one of the great performances, one of the great characters is Panama, uh, who is uh, kind of an unsung hero. Uh, in a lot of the proceedings in this film, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the goings-on with regard to uh, Eddie Bartlett and how Eddie, things that are happening to Eddie that he, that even he might not realize, but she does. So uh, uh, a lot of these points are touched upon with such great, uh, great uh, commentary from uh, Gary Giddens. And he's talking too about um, uh, the... Uh, uh, sort of the uh, um, the way in which this film sits, the kind of morality that seems to be sh uh, uh, shining through, at least when compared to other earlier examples of the great uh, gangster genre, uh, the Warner Brothers gangster film tradition. Um, and also we see maybe other differences uh, that seem to be setting apart this gangster film, say other earlier, more, um, for lack of a better phrase, maybe uh, vicious uh, portrayals of uh, the gangster. Uh, here we have gangster almost as a, uh, a comic figure, someone who is um, uh, uh, maybe prone to the whims of, of time, you know, the, the slings and arrows of things that are happening to him, and oftentimes looks maybe fool or even buffoonish in, in some situations. And I'm speaking here of yeah, the James Cagney character. So in many ways, I think Gary Giddens makes this a uh, great point, how it's setting itself apart really nicely. I mean, it's very much part of this sort of integral period of gangster uh, films and the Hollywood um, 1930 cinema, which is uh, very much in flux and very filled with so many touchstones of, uh, of movie cinema or cinema history. But it's also setting itself apart in terms of portraying the gangster 
in a slightly different light uh, than what audiences might have been used to. And that also, I think, uh, leads to how this film uh, has a way of, of uh, standing itself apart and maybe it it might uh, maybe there might be people who might be encountering this film and maybe finding themselves preferring say uh, the taste and flavor and approach of uh, uh, other films like say the Public Enemy etc. rather than the Roaring Twenties. But I think uh, part of the implicit uh, comment from Gary Giddens and others here is that this is uh, uh, this is part of the similar vein yet it's it's standing apart on its own and in that way it has a real timeless quality. It also has a way of showing different facets of the gangster genre too, which makes, I think, for a very powerful take, a very artistic take uh, by Raoul Walsh and company. So I really, really enjoy that here. Um, there's a, 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 a kind of a way of storytelling here uh, uh, and it's, uh, a kind of reflection of uh, of aspects of the jazz age that are, that are also embedded both uh, directly and also implicitly in, in how this film was made. Uh, maybe uh, uh, cultural uh, touch points, reference points uh, Giddens makes here uh, with regard to uh, George Gershwin or Ernest Hemingway, etc. And also the discussion of prohibition as a historical uh, a reference point that is uh, as well as World War One. And there are some scenes that are showing a kind of vicious sense of. Uh, amorality or immorality uh, with regard to, uh, for instance, there's a scene involving Humphrey Bogart's character early on, seen in wartime, just before the, the official end of the war, but there's an act that happens that could be said to be very, uh, quite a shocking act indeed. It's almost played off, almost brushed off in the context of the film, so I think it's very possible to to uh, watch the film but not necessarily uh, take that aboard or it is also possible to take that moment aboard and really consider this piece as uh, at the same time it is a, it's a work of entertainment a work of a sort of gangster entertainment which is so entertaining to the max on the one hand but also there are some moral ambiguities that uh, this film allows uh, questioning about and, and gives room for us the viewer to, to question and consider uh, and, uh, um, and oftentimes as an example it has to do with maybe the way that the the Humphrey Bogart character, George character, is uh, carrying on in his various dealings that involve a lot of violence indeed, and how people react and respond to that, and in particular, uh, James Cagney's character. So, um, yeah, these, I think, are, are just great points that Gary Giddens makes, and it, it lends itself, I think, to um, just a, a, a further reading that of this film, or further possible readings of this film, uh, that I think can sustain multiple viewings uh, with ease and with a lot of grace. And also, Gary Giddens talks a little bit to you here about the development of the story, and um, uh, the the view, the uh, the touchstone point of Mark Hellinger, uh, the way that the film opens as a type of uh, uh, um, um, uh, moral tale. Uh, ripped from the headlines type of feel about it, also in a manner of speaking. Uh, but also in terms of the production, how the, the story was told, uh, we understand uh, that there's a lot of uh, possibility for uh, spontaneity and ad-libbed sections, and that's pointed out here. And it's also pointed out a little bit in the commentary track as well. Um, and also uh, there's great uh, reference points, reference cues, uh, musical cues as well that are uh, discussed uh, here and also in the commentary track before it had to be used, Swanee, etc. Um, and uh, mentioning of uh, the great other performances. Uh, Priscilla Lane, some background about Priscilla Lane. Gladys George, I mentioned. Frank McHugh uh, and others. So um, uh, there is, I think, um, and there's also the sense, just to return to a point that was mentioned before, uh, the film as being about uh, tough characters that uh, are sometimes found to be in situations where they, where they are quote unquote not as tough, uh, and that could be seen by some to be a criticism. But in fact, that also lends itself, on the other hand, to a great deal of moral complexity that I think uh, makes the Roaring Twenties, at least as Gary Giddens and others have mentioned, uh, Lincoln Hurst or Gary Giddens and others have I think uh, uh, asserted with a great degree of um, uh, a great convincing degree uh, it makes for I think very compelling watch indeed and I think uh, creates uh, one of the most classic gangster films that is uh, that has a type of uh, calling attention to some moral ambiguity and it's not afraid of showing characters in different lights and, and, and moments of vulnerability, which even allow for furtherances of their characters to shine through and, and uh, stand out in ways and react in ways. Um, uh, at these very tragic pressure points, we see how they react and we see the true nature of them. And that comes uh, through in the brilliance of the performances. And so uh, Gary Giddens comments here 
I think are uh, really, really uh, well stated and well done. So this is a great one. So this is the, uh, the interview with expert Gary Giddens on the Roaring Twenties. This is approximately 22 minutes. So please check it out if you can. Next up, we have Raoul Walsh, and it says, This excerpt is taken from an episode of The Men Who Made the Movies, directed by uh, Richard Schickel, uh, which originally aired in 1973. In it, director Raoul Walsh discusses working with actors James Cagney and the famous ending of The Roaring Twenties. So, um, yes, so this is approximately five minutes, so it is an excerpt. So it's great to hear from Raoul Walsh himself. I should have mentioned, too, that Gary Giddens and also the commentary track, uh, the Hearst commentary track, does give some uh, very essential background details about Raoul Walsh himself and, and aspects of his career um, and leading to his working with uh, James Cagney and company here, uh, example being the Roaring Twenties. So, uh, but here we have Raoul Walsh himself and uh, some discussion here about uh, the Warner Brothers and the approach uh, with respect to the story of the Roaring Twenties and also the ending, you know. I made mention of the uh, this. It's one of the the, the great ending. It's a, such a great ending. It's um, uh, again. I don't want to speak too much about it uh, f uh, for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this wonderful film. But it is a it is a knockout, an absolute knockout. And so there's a type of crescendo that's built, and it's it's due to many uh, many aspects that make it successful. But of course, one of the key aspects is uh, the guiding hand of the direction of Raoul Walsh. So, so this is touched upon here. Um, it's brief. This is five minutes only, so it would have been nice to have been longer, but uh, I think uh, it's good to have. It's really, really good to have, especially for those who might be uh, new to the world of Raoul Walsh and might be curious as to uh, what uh, what the approach is from uh, the perspective of the director himself. So uh, please check this out if you can. Again, this is approximately five minutes. And then we have the trailer uh, to this film. It's a really entertaining, great trailer. So that rounds out the supplements. So on quant in terms of quantity and on paper, it might seem like not a lot um, in terms of the supplements themselves. But please keep in mind, we also have the commentary track. So that is also very, I think, uh, illustrative and very filled with information, a lot of information. So overall, I think we're getting a really, really good mix. It would have been nice, of course, to have gotten other things. I, I would love to see, for instance, again, this is a, um, it, there are a lot of mentioning of the, uh, the so-called Warner Brothers films or the gangster films. And there is a type of overview uh, to a certain degree in the commentary track and in the Giddens interview. But it would have been nice to have had maybe a, a supplement on, on what this is and examples of this uh, and Roaring Twenties, how it fits in. Uh, or doesn't, as the case may be, uh, to this uh, kind of uh, wonderful, entertaining genre, and how this film, um, right, in terms of what happened before uh, 1939, what happens after 1939, but or things of that sort. So that could have been interesting. Uh, so, uh, but again, for what we have, it's really wonderful, and again, it's accompanying a total package, which I think overall is very, very strong indeed. And just uh, some brief words about other aspects of the contours of this physical media release from. Criterion. Uh, we have the wonderful cover art uh, and the wonderful use of font here. I think this is really great. Look at that. Look at that. And I just point out to uh, the the inside. You know, I've uh, removed the insert, which would go on this side of the interior of the plastic casing. But look at that. Look at those discs, right? They have illustrations on the discs. Um, and there's a slight difference uh, in the sort of tinting of uh, the color scheme here. So uh, the Blu-rays here and then the 4K is what I have in my hand. So as you can look, slight, there's a slight difference in sort of the tinting, the sort of sepia uh, tinted look uh, that accompanies the Blu-ray versus the 4K. So I really love that detail. That's very cool. And of course, it's uh, mimicking some aspect of the of the cover art design, which is absolutely splendid. Um, and it, it goes into uh, some. Uh, it goes into the the, uh, the 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 insert itself. I'm I'm trying to be careful here because there is the the image, the great illustration that's also included in the insert. That's the Blu-ray menu image that actually could be said to be uh, a bit of a spoiler. So I'm just going to try to uh, you know, uh, resist showing that on screen again for the per benefit of those who have not yet seen this great film. But so watch the film as soon as possible. Really, if you haven't seen it, it's great. It's absolutely great. Uh, but just keep in mind here uh, the art. Art directors Sarah Habibi, Eric Skillman, illustration Jennifer uh, Dinos, uh, uh, Dionisio, excuse me, and designer Eric Skillman, art production coordinator William Breeze, and art assistant Julie Sussman. So I apologize for my mispronunciation, but let me say again illustration Jennifer Dionisio. So 
Uh, this is very, very cool and neat. Absolutely splendid. Absolutely fantastic. So I love this. Love this very much. And then uh, speaking of the insert here, okay, so it's the fold-out type. So I'm not a big fan of the fold-out type, but we have the wonderful essay. Another great essay here. That's right here. Uh, on this side of the fold hat. And this is called Into the Past uh, by Mark um, Ask. And uh, this is an essay which is talking about aspects of the, uh, sort of the underlying story, the, the production of the development of it, um, the, the touchstone of um, uh, Mark Hellinger, and also how it reflects sort of contemporary feelings. Uh, and also going into a discussion of the, the themes and character arcs themselves. So going into a kind of detailed a trajectory of the discussion of the film. And so please watch the film first. And then after you've seen the film, you can go into this great essay called Into the Past. Um, and uh, talking about uh, the, the careers of uh, uh, Cagney and Bogart and Raoul Walsh at the time in 1939 and, and how this affected their careers, what happens prior and, and leading up to this and what happens post this. Uh, and uh, also um, uh, just um, uh, other details in terms of the, the trajectory of Raoul Walsh's career and how this fits into that great trajectory, etc., etc. So another fantastic essay called Into the Past uh, accompanying this release of the Roaring Twenties. So please check this out if you can. It's really quite splendid. Really, really splendid indeed. So my dear friends, wow, yes, that is the Roaring Twenties. Um, and uh, it's a another great release. My goodness, you know, I'm thinking about 2024 and 2024 is really, there are so many sparkling, sparkling releases. And undoubtedly, the Roaring Twenties is up there. This is a strong release. I'm so happy about this. And I was surprised, very pleasantly surprised when I first heard that it was going to be released. And now it's here, giving you the opportunity to revisit this world. Uh, my goodness, what a thrill ride it is. Uh, the way it looks and sounds, it's glorious. And again, another reminder of the genius of Raoul Walsh and company and, and, and uh, Taggy Bogart and company. Wow, what a film this is. This is the work which is The Roaring Twenties. All right, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great, great movies, including The Roaring Twenties, including other films in the Criterion Collection and beyond. So until the next video, my dear, dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.